Good afternoon and welcome to our talk um, on how to use innovative data handling and processing techniques to drive alpha in the financial markets. Um, my name is Scott Sovine. I'm the director of the data and project management office at Parametric. Um, I kind of run all of the road mapping, uh, budgeting, and all the major data initiatives at Parametric. Um, I'm joined by Amir Alibadi. He is my primary data, or my only data architect. Um, he does all the work and implements the visions that we have. We're also joined by Chris Gambino. He is a Hortonworks solution architect. Um, it's really helped us out with our NiFi uh, solutions and projects. Real quick, uh, to tell you that we're um, Parametric, the financial services company. There's another one out there in the technical realm. Um, we build systematic, disciplined portfolio management solutions. Um, we have about $197 billion worth of assets under management um, as of the end of March of this year. We're currently located in three locations across the United States. Um, our primary one by headcount is Seattle, and that's where Amir and I work. Uh, we've been in business since 1987, so it's our 30th year. We also have a sales office in Australia. Um, I'll let you look through some of our little interesting uh, factoids up there, but what's really interesting about Parametric is our beliefs. Um, so our beliefs are that markets are already efficient. So uh, we, don't, um, we don't try to guess things uh, because we believe that with markets um, being already efficient, uh, that when you try to uh, outperform them, uh, you're always driving up or you're going to drive up risks and costs. Um, we're also focused on our portfolios. Um, we look at portfolio construction. We help our clients pick their targets, and we make sure that uh, if you're taxable, um, we're tax efficient. So we do know what tax lots that you're investing in. Uh, we also believe that um, rules trump emotions. Uh, we use lots of math, we're scientific, and we're engineering a base approach across the company from the top of the business all the way through the IT stack. So it's not just the IT guys that are engineers. All of our um, portfolio managers are also, we consider them to be portfolio engineers. So they follow a very rules-based, systematic, and pragmatic viewpoint. To give you an idea of what data sets that we have to consume from our third-party um, providers, these are all of our products and strategies that I yanked off of our uh, website about three weeks ago. Uh, we have released a new website, so this may not be there anymore, but I, hopefully it is. Um, it shows you all the uh, various areas where we have to pull data from. Uh, and that's what my data management office has to support. I won't go on into these in any detail, uh, but please take a look if you have time. To kind of give you an idea about our journey that we've run uh, through the big data space, we started in 2014. We asked um, our businesses, what was the major concerns that you had? What projects would you like to address if you had all the resources in the world? Over half of the responses came back, centralize the data. Uh, we have a lot of data silos in our company, uh, and that was a big item, was like, you know, I'd really like to have a data central um, suppository, or repository, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> that has cleansed and mastered data. So in 2015, we started the data management office. That's when Amir was hired, um, and that's when we really looked at a master data management approach. Um, we started thinking about that tool set. Uh, about the end of 2015, we actually uh, started using uh, a third-party uh, tool for that uh, that's commercial. Uh, and in 2016, we dived into the data. Uh, because the master data management tool didn't have the ability to store the data that we were mastering. So it was great at mastering, but we didn't want to use it as the warehouse uh, what contained it. We needed to find a way to drop our data into something else. Um, at that point in time, we started thinking about data warehousing. Uh, and honestly, we were going to go with a traditional approach, SQL Server or one of the Teradata's, the Paces of the world. At this time, Amir was reading some stuff about data lakes and open source, and he sent a couple articles to me, and then we looked at that and said, well, let's take a look. Uh, honestly, at this point in time, I was pretty sure that we didn't have the security, the speed of performance that the, you know, the traditional ones we could provide for the data lake. After reading through the various articles and coming to this conference last June, it really convinced us that the data lake was actually the way to go, and it provided the scalability that we needed. So jump into 2017. Um, we're now implementing our data lake. Uh, we went um, 
We use Hortonworks third-party services around October, or sorry, December of last year, and they helped us get up and set, uh, set up for both the production and the development environment. Um, and we've been going full blast trying to get that master data from our uh, tool into the data lake. That's our focus this year. We want to build the foundation so that our businesses have the right data for their uh, products and strategies. Going into 2018, uh, we want to modernize the data usage. Data discovery is a huge target for us uh, in, our, uh, in our office, um, but we also want to transition all those silos, those proprietary databases and applications that we currently have in our business to the data lake, taking it from the data lake. And with that, I'm going to transition over to Amir. Uh, and he'll kind of go through our environments and how we're all set up. Okay. Thanks for the uh, overview of the company, Scott. That's a good summary of what we do. So I'm more on the technology side. Uh, my job is to really figure out how we're going to use Hadoop, how we're going to centralize the data. And we're going to get to it, but a big part of our strategy is to use NiFi for moving all of our data around. But a quick overview of our environment. Um, we are primarily a Microsoft SQL shop. It's been like that for many, many years. Um, pretty much what you would think. We have a team of developers, C Sharp, SQL Server, PowerShell scripts, um, very traditional. We have a lot of proprietary applications that we've built that are used by our traders um, within the company. Um, but in our goal to centralize the data, we, in our choice of Hadoop, we've now brought in um, Hadoop to our Windows environment. So I think my message here is we are still a Windows environment plus Hadoop. We haven't really removed anything yet. Our goal is to um, decommission some of our systems and replace them with what, with what we build with Hadoop. Um, but at the end of the day, we're still going to be a primarily Windows environment with the data centralized into Hadoop. Um, kind of like Scott said, our, our, our data lake is, is our, what we're thinking is going to be a better way to build a data warehouse, if you will, than a traditional data warehouse. Um, a very key part of it, like I said, that last bullet there on the left is, is using NiFi to kind of do all of our um, data movement. I kind of I said ETL there, and it is capable of a lot of the transforms that we're doing, but it's primarily used to move data from our third-party data providers into our system. Uh, so what does our Hadoop environment look like? It's, we have two clusters. We have a development cluster, and we have a production cluster. Um, our production cluster is 10 nodes, um, I'd say common components. By that, I mean Zookeeper, HDFS, kind of the, the core things. And, and Hive is our kind of our initial use case for getting to our data, interacting with our data. Um, we have looked at Spark and other things, but I think our approach is to use Hive at first because we're much more comfortable with SQL. Uh, and with regards to NiFi in our production environment, we have a cluster of two NiFi nodes um, running in production. Our development environment is 10 nodes as well, same thing common Hadoop bits, Hive, and we have Spark running there as well to give us opportunity to experiment and compare Spark to Hive. But our general approach in the beginning here is to continue to use Hive for most of our data access and, and other things that we need to do. Uh, we, in our development environment, we do not have a clustered instance of NiFi. We have just a single node. Uh, yep, and you know my background is software development, um, so with our, a lot of our NiFi work that we do, we, I, I try to um, use those same concepts, SDLC concepts, where we develop all of our NiFi flows in production, we test everything there, and then we deploy to our, our or we develop in dev, and we deploy those to production. So we're trying to follow good practices, and uh, I'll be getting to um, my top 10, what I, my, my big part of my thing here is our, our top 10 best practices of using NiFi and kind of what we've learned along the way in our, in our six months or so, so far. Um, so that's what I'm going to get to. But that's kind of what our environment looks like. Uh, the green button, I think, is next. Yep. OK, great. Let's see what we have up here. So our old process was very time sensitive, meaning you know we would typically at a certain time of day, connect to our, one of our data providers and start downloading files. Um, that works OK, but what, what, what the reality is, most of the time, the data is not always ready at that time. Some of our data providers are late in delivering files, or other things kind of impede us getting to the files at that exact time. 
And so we're trying to move away from that and, and more to an event-based processing. And um, again, NiFi has been very instrumental for us to easily migrate away from this time-based at 7 p.m., wake up and start looking for files versus where NiFi is much more just it processes things as they show up. It's event-driven. We're having a lot of success. Even in the short time we've been using it, we've seen huge wins. Um, some of the bullet points there, you know, vendor data availability is, is good but not great, so sometimes files are late, and, and that impacts us processing files in our, in our old workflow. Our new workflow, when the files show up, we process it, so. Uh, so I guess the last bullet there is, you know, waiting for data is something we don't want to do, right? It's something we're trying to move away from, so the, the general message is, with NiFi and with our strategy is, is to try to be event-driven as much as possible. Okay, let's see. So the resolution, I've kind of touched on all these, but as, as, as part, our strategy, NiFi is a big part of it. And these are some of the immediate benefits that we got from NiFi out of the box with really nominal effort. Um, it is kind of event-based processing in itself. Uh, the data provenance concept within NiFi has been an, a, an extremely useful feature for us, and it kind of keeps track for us of all the data coming in, where it's gone, and you know what has happened to the data. Uh, the queuing feature within NiFi is also a big win for us, where if some of our downstream processing um, components or systems are, are either down or not working, uh, NiFi will just queue things up. And when we resolve those issues, things just kind of continue where they left off. Um, and all this comes for free. You know, you don't really have to do much to get all these features. Um, the concept of back pressure within NiFi basically will, as, as things queue up, it will slow things down, you know, downstream or maybe upstream, if, depending how you want to look at it. So things will kind of start slowing down within your, your data ingestion stack. Um, the other good thing about NiFi is it's extremely easy to create pretty complicated data ingestion and workflows. I'd almost say it's too easy because you can start to not follow some best practices that I'll, I'll touch on, but development is very easy, extremely rapid. You know, once you kind of understand the concepts of a flow file, you, know, you need to spend a little time to learn it, but kind of once you get going, you can create flows extremely quickly. Um, and there are a large number of processors. Um, our initial approach with NiFi, we thought we might need to create our own processors to, cons to be able to transform some of the files we get. And we actually did that initially, kind of to try to learn how to do it. And what we found was that given the processors that were there, we were able to really get the same um, net result without having to manage that code, you know, have the build server that deploys it and all that. So, I mean, our strategy is to try to use the components or the processors that are there if you can. So, and that's worked for us so far really well. We have really been able to do everything we wanted to do with the existing processors. Uh, I think this is back to you, Scott. Yeah, right. There you go. So we wanted to do some uh, a couple of quick wins with NiFi and just to show the uh, value to the business. And one of them is that um, we have a process where our clients will give us specific uh, identifiers, security identifiers, and we gotta roll that up to the company, the issuer ID, in order to restrict that stock from ever being held in their account. We try as best we can, but that's the idea, is that you, know, you don't wanna ha own any gun stocks in your portfolio, so we need to take all the various security types that are out there, and there's multiple types, and we wanna roll that up to the actual issuer ID. Now, the easiest way to do that is to take the various uh, identifiers that are in the um, financial markets, and there's lots of them, believe it or not, um, and roll those up into the single company ID that we get from Bloomberg. So how do we do that? Um, the easiest way is to take ISIN, which is probably the most specific, and then there's one called QSIP and CDAL, and then you keep walking down the tree until you end up at the last one, which is ticker, country code, and exchange and you try to see if you can hit and roll up to the company ID. Right now, the way that works for, um, oops, the way that works in the old process is we actually have our compliance department get a list in a spreadsheet, they send that to our help desk, which then goes to app support, 
which then queries our investable universe. Now, those are the stocks we actually have um, in our portfolios. It doesn't mean that we'll actually have the stock you want to restrict. It just means that we have at least a subset. And sometimes we hit and sometimes we don't. So that process can take three people about an average of five hours to get everything in, look it all up, and then send it back. That seems like a huge waste to us. So we use NiFi. Um, and I actually wrote this one myself because Amir's team's been doing this for about four months and I wanted to see if I could do it. So I immediately started throwing some processors onto its canvas and I discovered that, well, one, you know, we have an input, it's pretty consistent. Uh, two, um, we have an easy way of converting that input into a known format, a CSV file. And three, NiFi provides a way to notify our requester. So I wanted to achieve some targets. Minimal manual processing and IT intervention, I want to save some time, some money. Um, and then I wanted to make self-service a very easy thing for our business, because we're trying to wean them off of IT support. Um, as a bonus, uh, we're now searching the entire Bloomberg universe that's in the data lake. So we're not just in our investable universe, we're across everything that we get from the back office files. So this is what it looks like to the requester, because they said, I want it easy to use. The only thing that they now have to do is um, the client sends it in whatever format they have. Now they have to copy it into a spreadsheet that has distinct headers. And there's a reason for that, and I'll go that into that a little bit in the next slide. They drop it into that end folder. NiFi picks it up, processes it. When it's done, it sends out that email in the second spot, and then it drops uh, the results into the out file. No more help desk, no more app support, just happens. This is what the NiFi solution looks like today. So we have it coming in. Um, effectively, what happens is that file gets written into HDFS. Um, we write a query that then uh, does a union across all the various identifiers, gets one result set, drops that out into the out file, then sends as the last step, sends an email to the user saying, hey, your file's ready for pickup. Come get it. This took about six hours to create. Um, however, NiFi is incredibly simple. Whoops, too far. This is how it started. So I try to do everything in NiFi. I split the file, I uh, convert it to Avro first, and then based upon that, I um, broke it up into various identifiers, and I ran each row by itself per identifier against a hive table. This took about six hours to complete. The current solution that we have, again, which is this, takes about two to three minutes. So the lesson that we learned here is that just because NiFi lets you do it doesn't mean you should do it in that. Um, and that is a good segue into Amir's top 10. All right. So, all right. So like we've alluded to, we've been a, on our Hadoop journey for about six months or so. You know, we were here last year, this time, kind of figuring out if we wanted to even go down this path. Um, and, you know, we're well under our way now, and we've been using NiFi pretty heavily since maybe January of this year. So maybe six months or so, we've been really using it, trying to build out a lot of our data ingestion pipelines. And with that, um, we've had great success, but, you know, we've learned a lot along the way that I think would be worthwhile to share with people who are maybe considering using NiFi as well. Uh, a lot of this is based on HDF uh, 2.0. Um, so, and I've learned being here this week that um, the, the version that just came out, some of these that we are, some of these best practices that we're doing, you may not need to apply going forward because they've improved NiFi. And I'll try to touch on those um, as I go through this. So here's my top 10 David Letterman style best practices for using NiFi kind of in the enterprise, you know, because again, for us, we, you know, we can't deploy our own stuff to production, you know, but there's a lot of compliance rules that we're under that we have to follow. So this is kind of some of the things that we've learned to facilitate you know, our use of NiFi. So uh, number 10, and I don't know if you have used NiFi in here before or not, but uh, a lot of the NiFi uh, processors have this uh, run schedule, which tells it how frequently to run. And we've been burned a number of times in our dev environment primarily, where we would start building this POC and one of the developers will not set the, the, the run schedule, they'll leave it to zero, which means run as fast as you can. 
And what we've learned is if you don't do, if you don't really scale this back and you have it running as fast as it can and generating a lot of data, you will uh, generate a lot of data really fast. So you can overrun your NiFi cluster really easily. And we've had cases where we had to kind of reboot the box, try to shut things down, everything was locked up. So kind of one of our first things that we do if we're gonna do a POC is make sure that we scale back that run schedule just so it's kind of not, we don't want it to run out of control. And these would mainly be for what I would call in a flow, the head node of a flow, the thing that's driving what everything is doing. You don't really need to do this in subsequent steps in your flow, but it's really that top thing. You know, you don't want it just running out of control at the top. So number 10 is just kind of adjust your run schedule, primarily in dev environment, to kind of keep things scaled back a little bit as far as how quickly it's going to generate data or do things for you. Uh, let's see, what do I have for number... Ah, well, there's the, how you do it. I guess there is a, I don't know if you've used NiFi, but there's the run schedule is kind of this property that you can set on the component. So it looks like I got fancy there and circled it for you. Number nine, make sure you have plenty of storage space for your NiFi databases. So NiFi's got, I believe, four databases that it uses as a provenance, a, help me out, Chris, what are the four? Provenance, there's a data, the provenance content. Provenance flow file. Content um, and another one, right? But make it? sure you've, you've planned accordingly to have enough space to store all this data. One of the powerful features of NiFi is the data provenance, kind of keeps track of all the things that have come through your system. And a lot of that's stored in a database within NiFi, but you know, you have to plan for that and, and uh, decide how long you're gonna keep the provenance and make sure you have sufficient storage for the provenance. Um, in our early POCs we did on our own like a year ago, we didn't have enough storage and NiFi kept crashing and we were kind of like, well, this thing's not very good. It just turned out we hadn't planned accordingly. And um, so now we have you know, sufficient space. We have those databases on separate mount points from everything else. And that made a huge difference in, in the, the performance of our flows and everything else. So that was our number nine. Number eight. Uh, use process groups. So within NiFi, you can kind of logically organize your things into process groups, primarily, I would say, for readability, but you know, there's probably a number of other reasons, but I always view this as I'm developing software, so I want to have a lot of the best practices I've learned over the years, so I try to create process groups, name things logically, so it's easy to read and understand what a flow is doing. Uh, I think I've got a couple slides here that'll walk you through what I mean. So as, as one example for process groups, in our, de in our development environment, each of our developers has their own process group that they work within. That kind of segregates each of us from everybody else. Um, so if I'm in my, I always go into my process group to do any you know, POC, any kind of playing around, testing, and everything that I do kind of stays isolated from everybody else. Uh, we also have a process group that we would basically promote things we're working to into this releasable code process group, which is where we would take things that we want to deploy. So we kind of have things segregated in our dev development environment. Um, this is kind of one of the concepts that we use to keep things organized and cleaner. Uh, and another thing for process groups, like you can create a flow like this where things come in, you go and fork stuff out and keep forking, do stuff, and it kind of maybe finishes at the end. Don't do that. You might want to do something like this, where you have things come in, maybe that middle tier of the four boxes, you'd actually want to maybe put those in a process group and give it a nice name that describes kind of what's going on in there. And maybe you have another process group that takes the next four things and, and um, does whatever it's supposed to do and then maybe comes back at the end. So these would be equivalent things, but our, our approach is what's on the right there. So our philosophy is kind of do that instead of what's on the left. Um, again, main, mainly for readability and maintenance and things like that. I think performance-wise, I would suspect they're gonna run the same performance-wise, but the one on the right, I believe, will be a lot easier to maintain. Okay, number seven. Uh, create templates of single processors for easy reuse. So I'll try to explain what I mean here. Um, oftentimes when you're creating a flow, as an example, let's, there's a put HDFS processor. And when you use that, you gotta kind of fill out some, some attributes or some configuration properties. Um, and 
each time we did that, we would have to go fill that out, right? And we're like, this is kind of a pain to do. I want to maybe somehow re, I want to do it once and just reuse it over and over, at least this one processor. So what you can actually do is you can create a, you can create a processor, fill everything out, and then create a template of that processor. And then what we do is we actually just use that template instead of the processor directly, and that'll bring all those configuration settings and all the setup that you did just will be pre-populated for you. So that'll make your development a little bit faster and more consistent, because if everybody's trying to fill out those same things, um, it becomes a little bit of a pain. So, and I think I have some screenshots of this. So I don't know if you guys have used NiFi, but it looks, you know, you can, on the left there, you would, you know, you'd like, this is the put HDFS, I think. You kind of fill some stuff out. I don't know if I've got a laser pointer, but you fill some stuff out, and then you would save it, give it a nice name, um, and then it becomes a template, and it's available as a, as a template when you want to drag things on. So then on the right there, you'll see I've got this standard put HDFS template. So if I use that and drag it onto the canvas, everything will be already filled out for me. I don't have to go do all that again. Um, so that kind of simplifies some of the faster way to do our development and more consistently. All right, number six. Six, data provenance search facility. So one of the great features of NiFi that, that for us at least is the data provenance. It lets us go and see what's happened, see where things have gone. Um, there is actually a search feature within the data provenance. So you can go and do a, do a search. That's what would pop up. There's this dialogue that pops up and you can search by file name, file type. You can put date ranges in. That actually scrolls down. There's quite a few other things below the fold there that lets you go search your provenance. Um, this lets us quickly look for things that have maybe come through our flows and f figure out maybe what's gone on, if something's gone wrong, or if we want to look for, sp for specific things. So number six is... Yeah, just to interject here, one of the big ones that's saved me at least during development a few times here is the file name field. You can literally search one of your files, how it went through, and how that particular one might have failed or passed it yep. through everything and it'll sort out on the right each step it took. Yep, yep. And I believe that file name, you can do a regex in there too, so you can kind of do a little bit looser search if you needed to. Say again? What do you mean by data provenance? Data provenance is kind of a, the lineage of, like, when data come in, it keeps track of how that okay. file has moved through the system. So every, every processor, every step that NiFi takes is registers as an event, so it logs it, basically. It does an event, writes it down, does an event, writes it down. This is now a searchable log that's auditable, and you can see how the information got transformed. So you extract a piece of metadata, you can see what it was before the extract and what it was after the extract. It's wonderful for auditing. Yeah, it's a big thing for and data yeah, governance right, too. If, if people come to us and say, you know, show me when you ingested data from Bloomberg, like where did it go, how did you use it, and data provenance kind of keeps track of that for us. Automatically out of the box you get it, we don't have to do anything, so. And there are all, there is also APIs and everything. So NiFi is completely API um, built with, you know, almost API first. I think maybe they did that. So you can actually access this either through the UI or through APIs, depending on what you need to do. Uh, let's see, what do I have for number five? Okay, so this is one thing that we learned. So if you if you cluster in dev, then you probably should have it clustered. Or if you cluster in production, you should probably also cluster in dev. Um, there are if you just have a single node in dev and you try to build a flow and move that production, there are a few things that may not work as you expected because of the clustering nature of NiFi. Um, so what we've learned is, yeah, you, and you can actually create, what I've learned is you can create a cluster in dev of just a single node. You don't really have to have multiple nodes. You can just make it, make it clustered with one node. And then you'll get all the clustering features will kind of be turned on and you can start building your flows in production as if they're clustered. So there's certain settings that you need to do when it's clustered to get things to work right. Um, so our number five is, yeah, I still think you probably should have a, a clustered dev and a clustered production. Um, it doesn't have to match, like your production could be four nodes, but you can maybe have your dev as two nodes. I think that's probably a sufficient thing. This is important if you're moving from dev to production. Yeah. Because you wanted to template it, and right. that way the template properties are there right. when you yeah. move over. Yeah. Yep, that's we, what we, we learned. We learned. <laughs> <laughs> There's also an important note that an individual node can be set to think of itself as a one node cluster. So specific options like pin to the master node 
can be set in dev and then just rolled out to right. prod without additional ed yep. edits. Yep. These are my top 10. Doesn't mean I do them all. I'm just suggesting <laughs> that maybe we, we should be doing them as well. But things that we've learned, so yeah. Let's see what number four is. Okay, uh, set expirations on success queues. Uh, so what we do, um, and you know this, and, and I guess when I mean success queues, if you've got an IFI flow that's a file comes in and it kind of does some stuff and then it gets all the way through your flow and at the end it's done, you know, there's a couple options at that done stage. You could just say don't, if it's done, just terminate and don't just be done, right? What we do is we actually, that last step for most of our flows, we reroute it to a funnel and we let it kind of queue up there. That lets us go and look like, hey, did that file get all the way through? And you, you, can, you can get that same information from the provenance, but we find it really handy in a kind of this warm, fuzzy feeling where I can go in and I can look at that last step of a flow and I can see, yep, the files were downloaded today and they're in that success queue and they're sitting there and I'm like, okay, it worked today. And so what we found is, this is a, I actually like this still, but if you do not set an expiration on that queue, it'll just keep stacking up. And when that fills up, it'll cause back pressure and stop everything else from running. So if you are gonna kind of keep things queued up in this happy path, if you will, um, you should probably set expirations on those. So they might stay there for a day or two, and then automatically they'll flush out from the queue. If you don't do that, it'll just keep stacking up and eventually it'll stop everything else from running. So if you are gonna use this content of a success queue, um, you should probably set expirations on it. Number, oh, I'm showing you how to do it, I guess. So if you, the, so down on the right here, that the, the yellow box, I've got the success queue. When you do set an expiration, the little clock shows up telling you that whatever's in this queue will expire at some point, depending on what you've set up. And then the, you can set it up in this kind of this dialogue here, the, uh, the what does that say, uh, file expiration or something like that. You can put in one day, 30 minutes, you know, three days. And basically whatever is queued up in there will, will stay there that long and then it'll automatically flush out for you. And if you don't do that, it'll stay there until you go and, and, and empty the queue, so. Uh, number three, use custom properties per environment. So our, our kind of our struggle with NiFi based on the version that we have, and I know they're doing a lot of work to fix this is how do you build something in your development cluster and deploy that to production kind of almost hands off, if you will, right? I don't want to deploy something because I can't do the deploys myself. I'd have to write all this up and say, okay, deploy this and go and fix all these things. I don't want to do that. Um, so what we do to get around this is we use custom properties in our production environment and our dev environment. Um, and then we use those in our flows. And so then the flow is the same, and it just references those properties and to, to look up things and to use certain at, certain variables, if you will. Um, that works great. The, the, some of the challenges you'll find here is that not all processors or not all, all aspects of a processor supports an expression language, which means you cannot put a property there or an attribute there. Um, but it's worked pretty good for us. So we just have a, just a handful of things that we want to have just set up differently between environments. Think of it as a config file. If you're just writing code, you'd have a config for dev and a config for production. That's what we're doing here. So our NiFi flow, when we deploy to production, we don't have to change it. It just looks up those configs from, the, from that properties file. So it Amir. simplifies our deploy. Amir? Yep. Five minutes. Okay. I have only a three, and how many was I gonna do 10? So that yeah. means I got two more. <laughs> Create small, modular, disconnected flows. Um, this is another thing that I th think they're doing things to make this better. Um, but basically, um, my philosophy is I wanna create one massive flow that does everything. I wanna break it up. Quick thought process on that is we have something that connects to our third-party data providers and downloads files to HDFS. That's all it does. It just gets the file, drops it into HDFS. We have a separate, disconnected NiFi flow that is triggered by the downloader to actually process those files. You could create one big flow that does everything, but I would prefer it to be broken up. So if I need to make a change to my downloader, 
I just change the download and deploy it. I don't have to make a change or worry about deploying my processor or other things that ingest those files. Um, so I try to basically decouple the flows. Um, and it might look like this. If you have a flow like this that comes in and does some stuff, I think I'll just kind of, so you might have the top part that's downloading files from an external site, and then you might have um, a processor down here that's doing something with the files. This would be a connected flow. I'm kind of saying maybe don't do this, and maybe do something like this, where on the left, we have the downloader on the left side and the processor on the right. And then we just decouple it, and we have this downloader um, basically trigger through, through a queue the processor. So the downloader will download and drop a message on a queue saying, hey, I just downloaded this file. Go do with it what you want. I'm, I don't know what you want to do with it. All I do is download, right? And this thing just says, I just process files. So then I can manage those and deploy those things separately. So it's kind of like thinking about it as building modular applications or code. This is my number one one because it's number one. Update the names of your processor. So when you create a flow, the default name for a processor is whatever the processor is called. Put HDFS, fetch FTP, you know, whatever the thing is. That's the default name. And we have found it's absolutely imperative to give each of those processors in your flow a logical quality name, just like writing code, right? Um, if you don't do that and you go and look at your provenance or go look at things, you will not know what what step that was in a flow. Uh, there is a, some nice features in NiFi. There's a summary page you can go to that'll kind of give you a high level view of your workflow. Uh, and if you don't give good names, those things will not make any sense to you at all. So my number one thing that we do is make sure you rename each of your steps in the flows that you're building. Do not leave the default names there. It's really easy to go fast. It's really easy to get lazy, but this is our number one thing that we try to do. Um, and I think, I don't know, uh, so if you have like list FTP, you can zoom in, you can give it a better name, like wait for new files from Bloomberg is what I would call it, because that's what it's doing. And then, then the flow, that's what you would see. So on the left, you see it just says list, list FTP. If, if you rename it and give it a better name, the flow would look like this, wait for new files from Bloomberg. And below it, it's got what the processor is, the list FTP, but it's got a much better name. So if somebody were to come in three months from now and wonder what that thing is doing, hopefully this would make things much clearer. You can also do comments on flows and should be doing that as well. That's it for me. So I kind of ran it short. Sorry about that, Chris. There you go. All good. So I got a few minutes here. Just the challenges that you guys will actually might face implementing this in a, in a company. Working for Hortonworks, I've worked with a couple different companies I've tried to implement this. And one of the main challenges is it's, you have to start thinking as an event-based mindset. So the best way to think of that is, is if, if you have kids or if you ever were a kid, I think most people were, um, don't wait till the last minute to do all your homework. Don't think, it's 7 o'clock, I have to do all my homework right now. Do it as you get it. Your throughput, even a low throughput, like 50 megabytes per second, is 4 terabytes a day if you just do it continuously. So think, event-based, file ants, do it now. Don't wait for a batch process at the end of the evening. It's easy to get started. Don't be lazy. Uh, we literally showed code earlier that didn't have processor groups. People say spaghetti code, and now it actually looks like spaghetti if you don't do a good job. So it's very easy to go very fast. So what was it, four months versus a few days yeah. on development? Mm -hmm. During those four months, you have a lot of time to think about, am I making a mistake? It's much harder to think about that in the four hours since you started the project. So be sure to plan your projects. Name them. I, I can't emphasize enough. It's like telling people to comment their code. And just keep going straight. And at the bottom one, check your back pressure settings. This one has personally burned me. If you don't have good back pressure, your disks are going to be full. And then when it's time to show your boss, time to go to production, your disks are full. And it's, that's, a, that's a tough recovery state to start from. So check your back pressure, name your code, and start to include business people in here. So once again, over the course of six months, it's pretty easy to include lots of people in the conversation. In your four-hour session when you're trying to build your initial flow, spend an hour of that with the subject matter experts right next to you. Going line by line over Java code is pretty painful. It's a lot easier when it looks like a well-commented uh, whiteboard walkthrough. So you can actually bring it together a lot faster. And the last one, just because we're almost out of time, is don't be afraid to use custom code. Everything up until now was out of the box, it works great. Out of the box, it's perfect. 
but the moral of the story is you need to improve it sometimes. One of the ones that I've personally worked on is base64 encoding in the attribute layer. So if, when we started with NiFi, you could only encode base64 as a payload for NiFi. Now you can encode it as an attribute because we weren't afraid to modify it as needed. So keep in mind, when you're going to make a custom processor, it's four Java methods, and uh, Hortonworks has actually challenged people to do it as part of a hackathon before. So don't be afraid to add custom processors in. And with that, I don't know if we have too much time for questions. I look to the back. Um, yes? So a custom processor would be created in Java. What we could do is, though, have it make Spark calls. So at one point during their development cycle, they pointed out that they had Hive do the heavy lifting and then send the results right back to NiFi. In the same fashion, you can have Spark do some heavy lifting and send the results back to NiFi. So you can invoke it like that. And with that, I think we are about to be pulled off the stage by the people in the back signaling we should be done. So thank you for attending. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.